Uh, I'm Pam Mann. I'm the branch manager of the Hancock Veterans Memorial Branch of the Washington County Free Libraries. And today I'm talking to Robert Dugan, who has just recently written his first book, this one here, A Stranger Among Us, a novel of the West Virginia opioid crisis. Hi, Robert. How are you? Hi, Pam. It's, it's so good to talk to you. I'm well, glad so we glad could. to be here. Good. Well, let's just start right off with, can you tell us a little bit about your book? What is it about? Um, so the, the book is a, a animation of the, um, kind of the way I think that the opioid crisis has most affected West Virginia's, uh, communities of youth. Yeah. Um, and, and so what I was looking for in the book, um, was kind of, a novel that I felt like portrayed a more authentic experience um, and also provided maybe a more attainable roadmap out of um, the cycles of poverty and, and drug addiction. Um, I was, you know, the hillbilly elegy, um, you know, I, I felt like needed to be answered a little bit. Yeah. Um, and you know, I wanted to provide the the young people that I interact with as a teacher kind of a roadmap out of uh, out out of poverty. Not one that is um, that requires kind of a serendipitous um, lottery winning, like being selected to go to a uh, um, Ivy League school or being selected to do a study abroad in England at Oxford or any of those kind of things. I wanted something that was much more that, that, that felt attainable. Yeah. Yeah. Something that the uh, youth in this area could relate to. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Something that they could see as a reflection of their own experiences. How long did it take you to write your book? What, how much time did it take? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't, would say probably it, it would depend on the time you want to count as the start time, you know, because um, like most authors, I kind of experimented for a little while. The story became, the story was a short story and yeah. then it became a much longer project. Yeah. Um, so probably for the beginning of the idea to the end of the novel, at least five yeah. years and oh, probably wow. three really steady writing, two or three really steady writing on it. Okay. Wow. That is a long process. Now, did you have to do several rewrites on it or did you just kind of go with it as it is or how did you do that? Oh, it was, um, so it's a first novel. So yeah. of course it, it was a, there was a lot of time in the lab um, experimenting yeah. and learning and trying to figure out what um, the story was going to ultimately be. I spent a lot of time reading actually uh, about the, the process of being an author. So, um, you know, there's a book Ray Bradbury wrote about the process of writing. Um, <laughs> Stephen King's on Stephen King's on writing is like my, is my personal Bible. Um, and then, uh, the War of Art by Stephen Pressfield is another book that I that I used a lot um, for inspiration and this was um, yeah it was uh, so the reading and then I I tended to stick toward a uh, five hundred to a thousand words a day schedule okay Ooh. I find that's my sweet spot that's um I can so usually what I'll do is I open my document mm -hmm. and then I avoid it for a little while. You know, so I open the document, it's there, you know, I could look at it if I really wanted to, but I go yeah. over and check the news for a little bit or, you know, look at social media, practicing, you know, avoidance behaviors as, yeah. as, as we do. <laughs> um, and then once I finally decide to open it and work on it, I reread what I wrote yesterday, the day mm -hmm. before, and then I add 500 to a thousand of new content. Yeah. If I get to a place where the writing is coming easy, I might write more. 
but if I'm, you know, clawing it from the ether um, in general, I just, even if it's in the middle of a sentence, if I have a hundred words, I'm just, I'm yep. just done. It's a hard right. day. A little bit every day. A little bit every day, yeah. Now, um, where did you get your information or your ideas for your book? Where, where did the ideas come from? Um, so I drew a lot off of my you know, personal experiences growing up. Um, when the opioid epidemic hit West Virginia in earnest, um, I was an adolescent. Hmm. And uh, so just those observations about um, kind of this, this wave of drug importation into, into the mountain state yeah. um, that nobody was really, I don't feel like anybody was really prepared for. Yeah. Um, I think now it's, um, it's just watching those relationships play out. Like, I think now it's such a, uh, it's, it's so ubiquitous, the idea of the opioid epidemic. It's so ubiquitous that um, I think it's really easy to forget that if you step back in time to when it first happened, I feel like the public perception was, well, a doctor prescribed these to me, so they must be okay. Yeah. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of discussion about, you know, you, you take these pills for a week and you're going to have to go to rehab to get off of them. Um, you know, so they, they, they were passed out to people and you just, you could just kind of watch it creep. And that was where I, I pulled most of my, my inspiration, for, um, for the novel itself was, was that, that experience of watching kind of a shift in the, in the culture of my home place. Um, there's a, uh, there's kind of a cyclical theme in the novel. Um, it, it kind of begins and ends in the same place. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was something that I wanted to point out was, you know, we're still dealing with the repercussions of this. Mm -hmm. And we've, you know, to varying degrees of success, tried to address the, the, the opioid problem itself without really addressing the underlying you know, social issues in Appalachia that lead to the drug addiction in the first place. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, to discuss that um, kind of cyclical nature of, of you know, poverty, um, abuse, domestic violence, mm -hmm. uh, drug addiction, those kind of things. Yeah. How did you develop your individual characters? Did you... I combine some people in, into composite characters or um, changed different events around um, in, and change characteristics to better fit the narrative uh, as you do. So, so everything, everything is always in service to the narrative when you're writing. So if you have a character that you think would be really good, um, in a given scene, but there's not really a place for them in the larger novel, then that, that you know, then that character has to be, you know, removed. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. Yeah, and then you can you can fold the characteristics from the from the one that you removed into one of the other ones. Mm -hmm. So, in an early draft of the novel, I, there was actually, um, you know, the the there are pretty much three main characters in, mm -hmm. in the story. Um, you know, Daniel, Stephen, and Mike. Yeah. In my original draft, there was a fourth person there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So in, in the original draft, there was a fourth person, but I got about halfway through the book and I realized that this character just wasn't really delivering anything. Yeah. Um, it wasn't adding anything that couldn't be pushed off onto the other characters. Um, so I made a composite. And then I ended up with the, the three boys that are the main focus of the novel. So who um, got that care? Which of the, your characters got that character kicked in with them? Uh, Steven. Okay. Steven. Steven is a composite character. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he, uh, I had to, I had to go through and rewrite 
all of the scenes with him in it from mm -hmm. the beginning of the novel through. Um, okay. So that was that was kind of a bummer. That was like yeah. the, the, big, the big bummer moment where you're like, wow, I got 40,000 words of this and I just can't, I can barely use any of it. Oh, and that must have been tough. <laughs> the, the book, so the book, any anytime you have to burn it down and start over, it always comes out better. Uh, do you have any plans for another book? Have you got anything else in the works at the moment? I'm I'm about halfway through oh. a uh, a second novel mm -hmm. um, that I've been working, kind of working on uh, a little bit at a time, and I've kind of like reached a, a lull in the summer where you know it, it's hard to it's hard. To down and right at the computer um, when it's so beautiful outside. But uh, yeah. the short version of the book is it's a, it's an Appalachian Gothic tale about a uh, Pentecostal tent revival where they handle snakes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm, uh, the, the story that I'm trying to tell is I'm trying to tell a story of a young man who's um, he's kind of lost his way. He's flunked out of college um, and all of the jobs that are available to him seem just soul crushing. And he, he just kind of doesn't know which way to go. Um, and then he stumbles into this tent revival, meets a, a minister um, who is uh, suggesting to him that he's special, you know, so, so the supernatural element of it is that, um, he can, this is going to sound silly when I say it out loud, but the, the minister and the protagonist can both influence snakes with their mind. Well, that sounds interesting, actually. So you, yeah. you seem to be really leaning towards the young adult market. Is that the case or? Um, I, I think, like I think that, <laughs> well, I think that adults, I think that adults will read YA novels. Yeah. And I don't know that that always works that way in reverse. Yeah. Um, and, and as a high school teacher, um, I see my students, especially boys being very reluctant to read. And and I th and I think that it's I think that it's in large part just because they don't know that they like to read yet, and the reason that they don't know that they like to read is they um, they're taught things um, like we must always finish a book that we pick up, you know, that kind of things. Like you read the first page of a book, you can't start a second book until you finish that first book. It took me years um, and, to teach my husband he didn't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, well, and what happens is, you know, you start reading that first book and maybe you don't like it, but you feel obligated to finish it so you never pick up the second one. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to, what I, what I hope the novel achieves overall is that I want it to be an accurate reflection of kind of my experience as a, as a adolescent boy growing up in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. And I want to mirror my students own experiences back at them, you know? So, mm -hmm. because liter literature is best, I think when it's more true than true, it's condensed truth. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, if, if you're a young man, and you're trying to find your voice and you see, you know, you have this book and you, there's a sort of certain amount of familiarity there that you haven't found represented elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it'd be enough to, to suck them into reading. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then they'll experience all of the wonderful benefits that, that reading provides. That's a good point. Well, I think we have reached our time limit, and I really appreciate, appreciate your talking to us. Again, this is Robert Dugan, and this is his book, um, A Stranger Among Us, a novel of the West Virginia opioid crisis. And Robert, thank you very much for, for uh, talking to me, and I hope that um, we'll see you again when you have your next book out. It was absolutely my pleasure.
Okay, thank you. Thank you.